Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 160 of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, Big Z going to be flexing on fools because we're going to talk about hip flexion biomechanics. Yes, folks, you might think hip flexion is all sagittal, but it's far from the case. In fact, we can get way in deep with hip flexion to improve your programming selection for your Supreme clientele so they can move better, feel better, and perform like freaking rock stars. Because your boy, Big Z, has got a bunch of questions that have been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here. Fam recognized fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from, uh, I'm totally going to mispronounce this, but Jord, I'm going to go with that. Sorry if I got your name wrong, but here's what, here's what Jord asks. You mentioned various degrees of hip flexion for wide and narrow infrasternal angles. Why does this matter? What are the underlying mechanics? Thank you for all your great content. No, Jord, thank you. Hip flexion, it's uber important. And the reason why is because as I alluded to in the intro, it's not as cut and dry as we think. There are lots of rotational influences that occur throughout performing hip flexion. And understanding these rotational influences can allow us to better select activities for our supreme clientele based on their range of motion needs. For example, where's my, uh, ah, we're gonna bring my son into the mix for this one. But when I perform hip flexion at certain ranges in the lower ranges, the rotational elements are gonna be different than the higher ranges. How does this relate then to infrasternal angles? Well, I'm glad you asked. Folks, spoiler alert, we are built differently. There's some folks who are, have more of a uh, slender structural build. It doesn't mean like body composition, but we're talking about bone structure. There's some people who have a larger bony build. And based on those anthropometric differences, those folks are gonna be predisposed to moving differently uh, between the two. The way that we've broken up these two archetypes is based off of the infrasternal angle presentation. And this isn't you know, some measure that your boy or, or his contemporaries uh, have made up. It's something that has been prevalent in physical therapy and even well before that. Like, uh, I mean, th there's been measures of this uh, dating back to at least the, the 1920s from what I've seen. But basically what it does is it gives us some type of objective measure to account for these differences. And then based off of the infrasternal angle, and if you're, if you're tuning in for the first time, you're unsure what that is, check out the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash hip dash flexion dash biomechanics. You're going to get the HD version if you're turning on to the gram. There's a full blog with this. You're going to love it. Give it a shot. Check it out. But what the infrasternal angle does is it allows us to put a measure to these anthropometric differences. We have two different archetypes. We have narrow infrasternal angles, which have a more vertical uh, ribcage structure. So the, the infrasternal angle is right below the sternum, and it's just the shape of the inner portion of the ribcage. There's some who are more vertical. There's some who are closer to horizontal. And based off of these archetypes and the way that the, the skeletal structure, the axial skeleton, so your spine and the pelvis alter their shape to manage this, this orientation, that's going to influence what rotational capabilities your supreme clientele will be good at and not be good at. What I mean by that is those folks who are on the narrow side of things, their skeletal structure is going to be biased towards more eccentric capabilities. They're going to do a greater job of expanding. And generally, if I can bring Ted into the mix, they're going to have a spine that's going to be biased more towards a posterior directed force, or they're going to have greater posterior expansion capabilities. And because of that, 
And because of the way um, the movement of flexion, because really that's what we're talking about when it comes to the spine, it has a bias rotational wise, you're gonna see easier ability to externally rotate with these particular individuals. And if external rotation is easier because flexion and ER are paired, I'll dive more into that later, that means internal rotation getting smaller or compression is going to be more difficult. Conversely, if you have someone who's a wide infrasternal angle presentation, they're gonna basically be the exact opposite. So a wide ISA, more horizontally shaped rib cage, they're gonna be better at reducing space, compressive forces, because the axial skeleton is going to be moving more anteriorly, which is gonna promote extension which is paired with what rotation, folks? Internal rotation. So those folks are gonna have a harder time with external rotation. Okay, cool, Zach. So we know that narrows generally, of course there's gonna be some individual differences, but generally harder time with internal rotation-based activities. Wides, harder time with external rotation-based activities. So what? How does hip flexion matter for these? two individuals. Well, I'm glad you asked, because I'm gonna dive into that. Hip flexion is broken up into three distinct phases, and some of the research that I'm gonna be sharing in, um, in, in the show notes, again, zachcouples.com forward slash hip dash flexion dash biomechanics, is gonna outline the differences in these three phases of hip flexion. This concept is also popularized by Daddy O Pops, Bill Hartman, definitely check him out. He is my mentor. Way smarter than I'll ever dream of being. And uh, you can tell that we're, uh, we're father-son because we both have braces. But anyways, so based on this, we know that there is a rotational element as we move through full hip flexion. And it changes depending on the range that we're talking about. The three phases are from 0 to 60, roughly 60 to 100, and then 100 and beyond. Uh, and the reason why I say beyond is because there are actually some sexual differences with the full amount of hip flexion. Um, I believe in males and females ages 26 to 44, from what I read, uh, males will have roughly about 131 degrees of hip flexion, and females can get up to 140. Uh, it's going to be different depending on a ton of factors, how much central adiposity is at play, um, bone structure, so on and so forth. But basically we have early hip flexion, middle hip flexion, and late hip flexion. In the early stages of hip flexion, zero to 60, based on the way the posterior rotators, so your piriformis, your go-go's, the obturators, and the gamelli, based on the way that their line of pull is influenced in that early range of hip flexion, there's gonna be more of an external rotation action as we move from zero to 60 degrees of hip flexion. So zero to 60 has more of an ER influence. As we go up from 60 to 100, the rotational elements change. And as I go up to that position, now I have more of an internal rotation-based action at the hip joint. And that's evident based on the way the line of pull changes with your posterior rotators. You ever get confused about stretching the piriformis? You know how like the, the classic stretch is like that, that Taylor stretch where you gotta bring your foot up and then kinda do that sort of thing right there? Well, it's kinda weird, right? Because the, the piriformis classically is an external rotator. But wait a minute. You mean to tell me, Zach, that I stretch an external rotator via external rotation? Why, yes, you do. And the reason why that is, folks, is because when you get up to 90, 100 degrees of hip flexion, the line of pull changes and it becomes an internal rotator. And a lot of muscles have to do that because at the femoral tabular joint, the hip joint, there are no primary muscles of internal rotation. It's all external rotation base, but then, you know, a few muscles have that side hustle on that internal rotation side of things, if you know what I'm saying. 
And so the way that that happens is based on the line of pull change when we get into the 60 to 100 range. Cool. What happens at the end? Well, what happens at the end is I get to my end range hip flexion and if I can go beyond that, because as I alluded to, physiologically there's between 130 and 140 degrees of hip flexion. Some folks though can get even further than that. But wait, that don't make no sense because how do I get further in a range of motion that's not necessarily at the hip joint itself? Well, the answer, you wonderful people, is through relative motions happening at the pelvis and the sacroiliac joint. So what I mean by that is once I get beyond what's available, the sacrum and the pelvis has to change its orientation and shape to allow for you to go further than you ever have before. And so what will happen is as I get to the end range hip flexion, the sacrum is actually going to have to turn towards the flexed hip, which is counter nutation of the sacrum. When that turn action occurs and the sacrum counter nutates, sacral counter nutation involves the sacrum tipping backwards and the anominate rotates anteriorly. When the anominate rotates anteriorly, the acetabulum points outward, which is external rotation. So there's actually a re-external rotation action that occurs when you hit the tail end of hip flexion. So we have this horrendously inconvenient, or horrendously convenient, alternating action between external rotation in the beginning, internal rotation in the middle, and then a re-external rotation at the end. Cool. How does that relate to infrasternal angle presentations? Well, folks, as you recall, narrow infrasternal angle peeps, so your slender peeps, are going to have a harder time with IR or internal rotation. So we may actually work them in the mid zone of hip flexion. Your wides, they have a harder time with external rotation. So if the goal is to improve their movement capabilities so we can expand their movement repertoire, give them a bigger menu to choose from, if you know what I'm saying. There, we might work in the zero to 60 range. And if we can choose activities in those areas. So, I mean, think about, I mean, there's nothing that's specifically wonderful about any specific move because you could do just about anything. You, you know, if I'm working in the zero to 60 range because my peeps need more external rotation, I might choose a higher depth goblet squat and just ISO hold there. If I need something in the mid range, I might choose something like a split squat all the way down because at the bottom, that split squat's gonna be at 90 degrees of hip flexion. I'm at 90 degrees of hip flexion, boom, you're gonna be internally rotating with the best of them. And then if you need the finishing touches, you might go ATG squatting all the way down, what you gonna do about it? And that will get you the last bit of external rotation that you and your peeps need. And that's really the long and the short of it, is by knowing what rotational elements occur with hip flexion, you can better choose exercises to both enhance movement capabilities of your supreme clientele, or if you're pushing fitness, you might know what ranges of motion they might be capable in. Now, a couple things. Does that mean that, okay, I got a narrow ISA, we're only working at 60 to 100, and oh, oh my gosh, there it is, a wide ISA, worst I've seen. Do I only allow them to work to zero to 60? False. No. We have to first look at the assessment or the, the range of motion limitations that our people have because you can have narrow ISAs who've dropped off external rotation-based measures. You can have wide ISAs who've dropped off internal rotation-based measures. And you might have to make adjustments for those particular people. With that in mind, if you have someone who's got a loss of both measures, where do you go? Well, folks, the answer involves cups. And no, I ain't talking about Z cups right over here. I'm talking about these sort of cups. Something you might have your coffee in or your water. And the way cups fill up is 
from the bottom up. Meaning, if I were to fill this with some luscious drink, like perhaps a Fit Soda, they're not a sponsor, but they taste pretty good, and uh, they should sponsor me. But if I were to fill the Fit Soda into my, uh, my little thing here, which is Zach brand, how about that? They just misspelled my name, but whatever. But if I were to fill this, it has to fill bottom up. I can't just fill the middle of the cup. In order to get to the middle, I have to fill the bottom first. And then I can put liquid in the middle portion of the cup. What's that got to do with hip flexion? The same principle applies with a movement like hip flexion. Hip flexion has various rotational elements about it. And if I want to work in the internal rotation range, 60 to 100, well, folks, I got to be able to go zero to 60 first while preserving external rotation. Have you ever had someone or asked someone to perform hip flexion and you see them deviate out towards the middle very early in the range? Or uh, we had someone at the last Human Matrix, which folks, by the way, if uh, uh, the early bird for the Philadelphia one, October 23rd, 24th, 24th, it ends tonight at 11.55 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Sign up, it'll be in the show notes. But if I, you ever had someone where you can't even get them into midline? We had someone at Human Matrix, New Jersey, where uh, we couldn't even rotate the, the dude, and he's one of my dear friends, and he's got a great haircut, but we couldn't even rotate the dude's foot to, to hit the sagittal plane. So that person couldn't even get into the test position. In that situation, he has no ability to get into the mid zone while preserving relative motions at the SI joint. And so what a lot of times will happen is they'll have to do some type of compensatory strategy to be able to get there. And so if you ever see someone who deviates from the sagittal plane or you see excessive movement in the spine and the pelvis in early ranges of motion, well, they're not filling the cup bottom up. They got to go into a different cup in order to get into the ranges that you're asking. And so if you want to improve that person's movement capabilities, you have to address the early ranges of motion first. How do you know if someone has a loss of that early ER? The things you would look at would be looking at uh, your hip flexion measure, if it's less than 60. And you might be thinking, uh, well, uh, most people can get well beyond that unless there's structural pathology. But I'm talking less than 60 and not cheating to get into other ranges. So if you see you know, changes in ab wall tension, you see them move their head back, you see a deviation from the sagittal plane as you're trying to preserve the sagittal plane as you're moving through hip flexion, that would indicate a deficit in that early external rotation. If you see someone with a straight leg raise that's less than 45 degrees, that would also indicate a deficit in that early external rotation. If there's a loss of external rotation at 90 degrees of hip flexion, ER, it's gone. You got to get it back. And so you might choose various activities to work in that zero to 60 range, or you work on activities that improve external rotation capabilities. And you have to have that first before you can progress into the internal rotation land. If your goal is to preserve someone's movement options. And you, or you want to expand the movement repertoire that they have. Have to fill the cup bottom up first. Now, does that mean that, okay, we can't get into 90? What if I have a, a client who's fitness and they want gains or something like that? Does that mean we're only gonna roll around on the ground, do breathing, have a seance and hope for the best? No. You can still work into those later ranges, but what you might do to ensure that you're in allowing for as much movement as possible is you might choose some different uh, arm positions or different exercise selections that will still allow for loading, but it's not gonna take them into the end ranges that they may lack. So an example of that that I think is really easy to see is a split squat. A split squat is really nice because you go into, um, you start in early ER because you're at a high depth of hip flexion, but then as you go all the way down, you drive into that internal rotation zone. 
And let's say you have someone who has a loss of internal rotation, but you want split squats because gains. I get it. I like them. Actually, I hate them. They're like my least favorite exercise, and I try to avoid them in my own programming at all costs. But how can I allow someone to use something like a split squat, but if they don't have much internal rotation to begin with, how do I ensure that they're working in a range that they have access to, and that way it minimizes any of the deleterious um, issues that might occur with pushing someone into a range they may not have. Well, you might do things that limit the degree of internal rotation that is needed for that particular move. For example, if I do a split squat and I have an ipsilateral load, meaning that let's say my left foot is the, the foot that's in front, I could put a weight in my left hand. And what that will do is my body will actually rotate away from the front leg to counteract that weight because I don't want the weight to pull me to the ground. I gotta fight it. I gotta fight it real hard. And so the way that I'll do that is actually rotating away from the, the front leg. And so what that's gonna do, folks, is if I got my leg in front and I'm rotating away, I'm not gonna hit as large of amount of internal rotation at the bottom. Because as you go down into progressively more hip flexion, the sacrum is gonna to rotate towards the front leg. So if I have an ipsilateral load, that's gonna minimize that rotation of the sacrum towards the front leg. So that could be a way that you could still utilize something like a split squat, but you're not pushing them into end range internal rotation. You're even keeping somewhat of an, an external rotation bias throughout the movement. Another option could be to use a front foot and a heel elevation because the front foot elevation is gonna minimize loading through the front leg, one, and if you elevate the heel, it's going to bias the front extremity towards more external rotation. So you see, just by making a few manipulations to a move, I can still get a pretty good training effect, yet at the same time, I can respect the amount of range of motion that my person has or does not have. And it's just little tweaks like that that we can apply by understanding the various rotations that occur throughout hip flexion and what our clients need. You don't have to sacrifice fitness gains uh, by, you know, by someone having particular movement re restrictions. Also too, you can improve those movement restrictions and improve fitness oftentimes at the same time. We don't have to have this zero sum game between these two qualities, at least for most of our people. And we're talking general population. Might there be some sacrifices at the tail end of performance if you're doing something that requires large, large amounts of force production? Sure. But for the overwhelming majority of who we work with, it's probably not the case. And you can still pursue increasing movement and fitness at the same time. To summarize this amazing question by Jord, folks, um, hip flexion, three phases, ER at zero to 60, IR from 6,100, and a re-ER from 100 and beyond. Narrow ISAs may have a harder time with IR. Wide ISAs may have a harder time with ER. Both with progressive compensatory activity could be limited in all directions. Solution, fill your cup from the bottom up. You gotta get the ERs before you get into the IR zones. So choose activities where you're working on early phases of hip flexion at zero to 60 if there's an ER deficit, and then you work on the mid zone and then finish it off with that last ER. If you wanna use zones that you, in theory, don't have access to, use modifiers to allow yourself to get, to get into those degrees of hip flexion, but not driving the amount or a large amount of the rotation element in each of those. That could be ipsilateral loading, that could be using something like heel elevation, or if you want to drive range of motion more so into that range, do a contralateral load. And if you do that, by golly bows, you're gonna improve your supreme plantels movement. You're still gonna go after fitness and no one will mess with you and your peeps. Unbelievable question. 
the next question. And the last question that's scheduled before I go into you wonderful folks on the gram. This one comes from Jonathan. And here's what Jonathan asks. If I'm un understanding you right, you had a video where you're talking about innominate respiratory patterns during hip flexion. And during this, or yeah, during this, I noticed that you mentioned hip flexion, internal rotation, and adduction of the femur are paired. And then when going into hip extension, it's reversed. But I got confused. You also said that the following movements are paired. Extension, adduction, and internal rotation, as well as flexion, abduction, and external rotation. Could you clarify which is which? Why, yes I can, Jonathan, and the answer is both. Zach, that didn't help. Don't worry, I'm gonna break it down for you like on Triple H. So the question involves the difference between how the innominate moves during respiration, or the innominate in the pelvis, that is, in relation to what's going on at the femurs, versus if I'm moving the femur in relationship to the pelvis. So I'm gonna unpack that for you. First thing we're gonna look at is what happens to the femur when I just breathe. If I'm breathing, what happens is the diaphragm descends so the lungs can fill. And when that happens, the viscera has to move downward. Your pelvis has to change its shape to accommodate that downward displacement of the viscera. It has to create an increased surface area effect so it can catch it like that, boom. So it gets into this catch position. So now you could envision viscera moving down into my hands, boom, I caught them. What did I do to my pelvis to catch the downwardly displacing viscera? Well, what I did was I expanded in all directions, but then I also drove sacral counternutation Sacral counternutation involves the sacrum tipping backwards. The lumbar spine is gonna go into a flexed posture. And the anominates are gonna be anteriorly rotated and ER'd, externally rotated. With that in mind, now let's look at what the movement is going to be in relationship to the femur. Here, when I perform that action, if you watch from the side view, if the sacrum counternutates and tips backward, we can see that that's a relative hip extension action. Me tipping the sacrum back is the same thing as me extending the hip. Let's look at this from the front. If the sacrum counternutates, you can see the infrapubic angle. So you got the pubic symphysis where my finger is right now. If I dip right below that, you got this V or this A-shaped angle right here. That is your IPA coming soon to a bar near you. The narrow, it narrows right here. When that happens, the bottom of the pelvis, the pubic symphysis, and the femur move further apart. You can see right there. Right there, there we go. If it's further apart, that is abduction. Abduction means away, just like that. That's abduction. They're both one and the same. So we can see during inhalation, abduction occurs. The last thing, since the anominates are rotating anteriorly, which is external rotation, the acetabulum is gonna orient backwards, which is external rotation. Therefore, the femur is also going to be in external rotation. And so when you breathe in, the femur is going to be extended, abducted, and ER'd. When I exhale, I gotta now push the viscera upwards. So I gotta squeeze the pelvis at the top. That's gonna involve sacral nutation, which is the sacrum tipping forward. The innominates are gonna internally rotate, and the viscera is gonna move upward. Diaphragm will ascend. You get air out, life is good. Now let's look at what's going on with the femur in this particular instance. Here, when the sacrum nutates, the pelvis tilts anteriorly. When the pelvis tilts anteriorly, that's gonna be hip flexion in the sagittal plane. Can you see that? This movement here, anterior tilt to the pelvis, 
is the same as me flexing the hip. Just one bone is moving relative to the other. Now let's look from the front. Same song and dance. If I nutate the sacrum, you can see that the infrapubic angle is getting wider. That's going to cause a deduction of the femur. You can see the infrapubic ramus and the femur get closer together, which is a deduction. Lastly, when the anominus IR, you can see that the acetabulum on the right is pointing closer towards you. That's going to cause a relative internal rotation of the femur. And those are the relative motions that we see at the femur when we're just breathing. So you breathe in, counter-nutation of the sacrum, extension, abduction, external rotation. You breathe out, nutation of the sacrum, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Now, that is different than when I'm just moving and grooving at my femur. Whether you're squatting, sprinting, kicking someone in the face. No, I'm not condoning violence. No one was hurt in the making of moving debrief number 160. But basically, anything you do with your lower extremity, that's a different movement. When I flex, even though in the last question we talked about there's some internal rotation components during hip flexion, the general bias is towards flexion, abduction, and external rotation. Those are paired mechanics when I do something more actively. Conversely, if I'm driving hip extension, regardless of the range, the general action that occurs there is extension, adduction, and internal rotation. That is different than the relative movements that happen at the femur when I breathe in and breathe out. And that's really the big difference. So you can have both. It just depends on the context that we're talking about. If you're just moving, it's flexion, abduction, ER, extension, adduction, and IR. If we're looking at the relative position of the bones as I breathe in and breathe out, during inhalation, the femur extends, abducts, and externally rotates. And when I exhale, it's flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. Awesome question, Jonathan. Let's see what uh, Michaela says. If you have a narrow ISA that's asymmetrical and lost ER and IR on the right hip, what do you have to do first after getting a stack? Do you go after ER or IR? So if you have a narrow ISA, this is a really good question, Michaela. So let's sequence how they might lose external and internal rotation. So if I'm a narrow, first movement is counter of the sacrum just based on their structure. So that means they should have ER, but they're going to drop off internal rotation. So all's well and good. Now, if by some chance they start losing external rotation and they actually pick up internal rotation, the way that that happens is actually by anteriorly tilting or orienting the pelvis. I'll give you a visual so you can see this. If you go ahead and bring your arm out to your side, like so, and you internally rotate your arm, you'll notice, and you'll notice if you're watching this right now, that your boy has about an LOL amount of internal rotation. But I can pick up a bunch real quick. You ready? Wow! How cool is that? Not cool, because all I did was tilt my thorax anteriorly, and what that does is that changes the relative orientation of the glenoid to help me pick up internal rotation. But it comes at a cost. And the cost, folks, is a loss of having relative motion available between my thorax, my humerus, my scapula, etc., etc. Apply that same principle to the pelvis. If I anteriorly tilt the pelvis, it may allow me to pick up more internal rotation, but it comes at a cost because I don't have relative motion available at the pelvis, meaning I don't have the ability to nutate, etc., etc. And so what you might see in that case is an increase in available IR, but you'll see a deficit in, in ER. And, and how would you know? Generally, that happens if the total arc 
of rotation, which is about 100 degrees, is less than that. So, for example, if you saw someone who maybe has 40 degrees of IR, which is considered normal, but 20 degrees of ER and they're narrow, uh, generally they, that occurs because of an anterior tilt of the pelvis. Conversely, if I have someone who's got 20 degrees of ER and IR, then you're dealing with a different animal. That person has had concentric activity anteriorly and posteriorly. So there's no change in the orientation. They've just got progressive movement restrictions. And the way you would address that is gonna be different in each of those scenarios. If it's the first case with the anterior tilt, you gotta do all in your power to stack and keep it sagittal. Because you have to be able to change the orientation and then use breathing to help restore the relative motions. Because as we talked about with the last question, if I'm breathing in and breathe out, and I can do so in a posterior tilt or orientation, that may give me the potential to have some restoration of normal sacral movement. And yeah, the sacrum only moves about two degrees, but you can alter the contractile properties of the pelvic floor and the ab wall and the diaphragm. So you wanna go with that first with those peaks. So you may stack a bunch with them, but I would keep them in the zero to 60 range because of the ER deficit. What about if you have someone who is super limited, front side and back side? Well, the issue with those people is that when they stack, they might not be able to isolate to the pelvis only. These are gonna be the peeps that when you have them go ahead and stack, they move the entire spine as a unit. And we don't want that because all they're doing then is they're just changing the orientation of the entire axial skeleton as opposed to getting into a position to allow for relative motions to occur. With these people, I like rolling base patterns to help teach them to move with less tension. That can help them restore relative motion. If you got manual skills, you're a clinician of some sort or an LMT, doing various manual techniques to help restore motions, or even very mild offsetting. I'm not talking like big stances, but maybe you just do something where one foot's a little bit ahead of the other. All of those could be better strategies to use to help increase the rotational capabilities of these peeps. So you still wanna go after ER before IR in this case, but if someone's got an anterior orientation, you wanna work on the stack like to the nth degree in the zero to 60 range with your exercise choices. Hook line tilt's a good example. But if you got someone who's limited uh, drastically front side, back side, think manual, think rolling, think chilling like Bob Dylan, think offset. Awesome question, Kayla. This is a good question. Uh, underscore placidal. So if my straight leg raise is less than 45 degrees, but my supine hip flexion is 120, does that render my hip flexion actually compensatory? Most likely. A lot of times what you'll see when you're testing hip flexion is very early on the range. You might see some movement of the ab wall occur. You may see some rotational actions occur through the pelvis. You may see something happen at the down leg. Those are all things that you have to be mindful of when you're testing hip flexion. And I would put money down that there's a good chance that you likely have one or all of those things happening as you bring someone up to hip flexion. The other thing, and you can't really sense this when you're testing it actively, but if you're passively getting tested, if you start to feel a little bit of initial resistance as you're moving through the range, there's a good chance that that would also be an indicator that there's a restriction at play and you're likely picking up motion elsewhere as you go into hip flexion. A lot of times practically, I'll see this a lot when I'm testing people remotely, but uh, if you're testing someone remotely, um, I've been using the straight leg raise a lot more as an indicator because it, it seems to be a better approximator of picking up those early restrictions. So I would use that as your guide. Folks, I think that's a good stopping point for us today. I really wanna thank you for tuning in and, and asking some unbelievable questions. I really appreciate your support and I love that you're a part of the fam. So thank you for that. If you wanna learn more, check me out at zackcouples.com. Again, Human Matrix, my seminar, the early bird for Human Matrix Philadelphia ends tonight, 11.55 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So definitely check that out. But if you go to zackcouples.com forward slash hip dash flexion dash biomechanics, you're gonna get access to show notes, a blog, podcast. You're gonna get the HD version. You're gonna get it all. So thank you for that. 
Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been an incredible, outstanding audience, and I hope that you keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.